Um, so today for the volunteer classroom tutor and classroom aid webinar, we have um, Carol Unseld and she's going to be talking to us about teaching adults alphabetics and fluency, which are both uh, really important components of reading. Um, so Carol, take it away. Okay, well, thank you, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. It's so nice to see all of you. Um, I'm excited about today's webinar, but also uh, when uh, Rachel asked me and she said, you have an hour to talk about alphabetics and fluency, I thought, well, that's going to be hard because there's so much. So I'm trying to distill it down to the most important pieces. So, um, and today we're going to, I really want to start with a very high level overview of what is, what's the science of reading? How do people learn how to read? Just a very brief sort of understanding of that, I think is really important to really understand why sometimes you have to focus on teaching the very basics of alphabetics and fluency um, in order to help students really fill the gaps that maybe they've missed along the way so that they can be more proficient readers um, and read at higher levels. Um, and we're going to focus right in, as Rachel said, on alphabetics and fluency. So the first thing I want to do, uh, we're going to keep it simple today with the with our interactive technology since we only have an hour. But I'd like to just get a sense of who's in the room. So I'm wondering if you would be able to use the chat and maybe just uh, put a quick answer to each of these questions so I can kind of scroll through and, and see who's here and where you're at um, with your with your understanding of teaching reading, especially in the areas of alphabetics and fluency. <clears throat> so I'll just give you a few minutes to kind of put that together and this will be an opportunity to meet each other. So we're starting to, um, responses are starting to come in. So kind of as we thought, it looks like we have a wide variety of individuals who with a whole range of experience. Some of you maybe have never taught reading before. Um, some of you, you may be working with your first student. Um, good, and some are working with English language learners. That's an important piece. And alphabetics and fluency are really important strategies for your English language learners. Things that you can, are gonna be able to take from today and just start to implement um, with your students. Lots of resources for you today, for all of you, really. Um, Social studies, adjunct, tutor coordinator, GLD. Well, this is excellent. Well, thank you for, um, for sharing some information about yourself. That gives me a good sense of, and it gives each of us a good sense of who's in the room today. So I'm just going to close that up. Mm -hmm. I had, I also had someone who I think maybe accidentally sent it to me directly instead of to the uh -huh. group who said that they're in a one on one group and they're working on writing skills. Well, that's the other thing that I did notice is that there's a one-on-one -on -one and then there's small group. And some of the strategies you can really, that you're going to see today, some will be for one-to-one -one and some will be for small groups. So I think that we're going to be able to meet the needs of everybody who's in the room. Good. Thank you so much for that introduction. All right. So moving on. Um, 
So let's just start with the definition of reading for adults. I think we all know that reading is a very complex process that probably we don't really think about that much anymore because it's something that's become an automatic process for us. But at the same time, we are decoding letters and letter sounds and blending them together. We're putting word parts together. We're putting words together and they're making sense to us as phrases and sentences and paragraphs. And at oh, the same time, enough. we're evaluating we what we're reading. Developing the I think somebody just joined maybe. Uh, and if you wanna mute yourself, that would be excellent. Um, so it's a very complex process that we're asking students to do. And we're doing it for so many different reading, for, for so many different reasons. Sometimes we're reading because uh, it's something that we have to understand for our job or something that we have to do uh, for our community. Um, sometimes we're just reading to learn or for pleasure. Um, often we're reading to make decisions. Maybe we're at a doctor's office or we're at school with our children or um, you know, maybe we're trying to decide how we're gonna vote, who knows? You know, There's all kinds of things that we're um, trying to make decisions about. And one of the ways that we take in information is through the reading process. But it's also a way for us to connect to resources when we're trying to find a job or get information about maybe a product that we want to buy or, or anything. I mean, you can think of a million things. Um, and also, it's just a way of, you know, writing and reading what other people are reading or sending to us, a way for us to connect. So the definition for reading for adults is a very complex process that's used for many different reasons, but it's also used in many different ways. We might be reading something on a computer screen, or we might be reading something uh, out of a textbook or a manual, um, or we might be trying to read things like using social media. So there's so much decoding that's happening at the same time that it is a very complex process for somebody who has gaps in how they learned how to read and, and their neural pathways are not operating with the same um, automaticity that maybe we are that we don't even think about anymore. So just I think that's an important thing for you to think about. But the science of reading tells us that we really have to develop skills in four particular areas. First, we have to understand alphabetics. And alphabetics is when we were think, way, way, way back. We might not even remember doing it. It's when we were learning phonemic awareness and we we're working with phonics and we were learning what letters sounded like. We were learning what letters, when we blended them together, sounded like. We were learning how to look at a letter that was written on a page and know that it was an S and it made the sound S, right? So we don't even think about that anymore. But there are many students that we work with who have gaps in their alphabetics process. That might show up to you and they might have a really hard time with spelling because they don't know the rules of sounds and spelling. Um, it might show up to you when they are reading a word and they insert a different word that's similar. They're probably not decoding the letters and blending the letters together appropriately to get the correct word, which means they really don't understand the meaning of what they're reading. So alphabetics is something that we don't think about a lot with our adult learners because it's something that's early literacy, but it is um, an issue for many of our students because they miss some um, components of that learning process. And for our English language learners, they're learning the language. So it's a really important part of the process. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, but weakness in alphabetics affects everything else. And that's the same for each of these components. You know, if we go around clockwise um, on this slide and we look at fluency, fluency is the ability to read smoothly, to read with good speed, and um, to read with accuracy. So to be able to read the words that are on the page, right? Not skip words, not skip word beginnings or word endings, not insert different words. Um, so with fluency, what we're really talking about here uh, again, is oral. Can a student decode what's on a page, see those letters and know what those sounds are and how they blend together at the appropriate level? And can they read smoothly with good, what we call rate and prosody? Do they know when to take a pause? Do they know what the period means? Do they know what an exclamation means? Do they know what an 
you know, signal words like and means when they're reading a sentence. If you've ever tried to read something where there are words in a different language that you don't know, for example, I was reading an article out loud to my husband and it had words in German and it was a, an article about Germany. Uh, we were going to travel there. By the time I got to the end of it, I'm like, I have no idea what I just read to you because half of the words I couldn't pronounce. So fluency is a very important part of comprehension. And if you're reading too fast or you're too slow, sometimes you're not understanding the meaning of what it is you're reading. So fluency can really affect uh, comprehension um, and the other components as well. And then if we move down to vocabulary, which we're not talking about today, but it's an important component of reading, our students generally come to us with a pretty broad oral vocabulary. There's a lot of words that they might know. So you may think that they can decode those words when they're reading them from a text. But the truth is that they might have a good oral vocabulary, but they might not recognize the word when it's written on the page. And so we really do need to also be focusing on building the breadth and depth of vocabulary for students along the way. And then finally, that all leads to um, the fourth component, which is comprehension. And at our earliest levels, our first comprehension skills are listening comprehension. It's what I was talking about in terms of alphabetics, that when I hear you say a word, I can identify that the first letter is an S because I know it's s -s say, right? So listening comprehension is our first level of comprehension. But as we move through um, and develop our alphabetics, fluency, and vocabulary skills, then comprehension really starts to become more about what we see when we talk about our standards, which you may or may not know, but it's things like understanding what is the author's purpose or understanding um, that this person is writing an article to state their opinion, but can I evaluate that to know if it's factual or if they actually made their point? Um, you know, so comprehension has a wide range of skills that, that you learn. And I think last year, maybe there was a workshop on vocabulary and comprehension, but those are the other two components. So we're not gonna focus on those today. So weakness in one area can affect each of the other areas. And it's important for us to think about teaching reading from four components. Um, and that is especially true when we go to this next slide. Um, I'll kind of give you a second to look at this, but the four components you can see are across the top of this slide. And here's what the science of reading tells us. It tells us that if you have students that you're working with that are a grade level equivalency of one to 3.9, they're in the beginning reader block and they really need you to focus on alphabetics and fluency. It's the priority for them because until they fill those gaps in those areas, they're really gonna have a hard time moving on to higher levels of um, text complexity, right? They're gonna have harder time moving on to reading higher things. And I wanna say here, and I'm gonna kind of come back to this, we need to be sure that we're putting text in front of our students that is at their reading level or just a little bit higher to challenge them. Putting something in front of them, who, you know, a student who is at the grade level equivalency of a fourth grade reader, giving them something that it's a ninth grade reading level is only going to frustrate them because there's going to be too much for them to decode. And really, you know, it, it, it becomes um, something that they probably experienced in school before and it might be the reason why they're with us now. We need to really give them things that are an appropriate level for them. But when we look at that middle group, the intermediate group, those, re those students who come to us that are at a grade level of fourth grade to 8.9, this is the group that really needs to focus on all four components. The priority being alphabetics and fluency and probably vocabulary first, really kind of dealing with those things um, before getting into high levels of comprehension or working on those comprehension skills. But they need to be, they need to work on whatever it is they need, their gap is really in. You'll find that some students really just need to build their vocabulary. Some students, when they read to you out loud, it's very choppy and they, or they read fluently, but they don't remember anything that they read. You might need to come back to alphabetics and fluency for those students. 
And then there's our advanced readers. I think a couple of you said in the chat that you're working with individuals who are getting or working towards getting their GED. They might be at the ninth or 12th grade level. They really need to focus on vocabulary and comprehension. I think typically we spend, I used to admit, be an administrator of a program and what I saw before we really started diving into this was that we really focused on vocabulary and comprehension with everybody. And that really wasn't helpful for those students who were below the 8.9 grade level, you know, between below the 8.9 grade level. We really needed to back up and talk about alphabetics and fluency. So if you have a question, um, feel free. That's just kind of the high level overview of the science of reading. We know that there's these four components and we know that some of our students really need that focus in alphabetics and fluency as well as vocabulary and comprehension. If you have questions, Rachel uh, and Lynn are gonna be monitoring the chat and you know, just you know, jump in Rachel and let me know if there's a question, I'd be happy to answer that. Uh, there is a question, Carol, um, which is how do you keep alphabetics interesting for adult students? Well, that is a very good question. Um, you know, it's my experience that uh, when a student has, an, you know, has a, an issue with maybe recognizing the beginnings of words or endings of words, or they never really learned what O-U-G-H, how, how to blend that together and how that sounds, and you spend a little time focusing on that, it's like you're meeting their very specific need. And very often, Nobody has done that for them. And so it's been my experience as we've started this work in, in our agencies is that the students are, you know, it's like they're actually your partner and they're learning for a change. <laughs> and they are able to say, boy, I struggle with this. Or, or I, you might say to them, I noticed that when you read, you often don't, you drop the ing or you don't read the prefix or whatever it might be. Um, and that changes the meaning of a word. And so let's talk about that a little bit. And they might go like, wow, I never knew that before. But I think when we are meeting students' needs, they really are interested because it's something, it's refreshing <laughs> for them to say, yeah, this is a gap I need to fill. And with alphabetics and fluency, you don't need to spend a ton of time, 10 to 15 minutes, maybe during a class or a couple of times a week is going to make a really big difference, especially when you're focused on the parts and pieces that they need. Um, so that's a great question. I hope I answered it. If I didn't, please feel free to give me a follow-up. Um, there's also one more question from Sumalatha, also about the previous slide, asking why beginning and advanced are homogenous groups. Um, so what that really is saying to us is that if you are coming in with a TAPE score or a BUS plus score or a CASA score of you know, below the fourth grade level, that you really have to focus on your alphabetics or fluency skills. And you can take a group of students and put them together and work on that with them together. They don't need you to sort of identify individually what their priority is, right? And the same would be true of your ninth through 12th grade level students. Those students, they have a good enough understanding of alphabetics and fluency. They, they, their skills are such that you really don't need to focus on that, that you can really focus on building their vocabulary. That's going to get them the biggest bang for their buck. And focus on um, working on the skills of comprehension. How do I find the main idea? How do I give you key details? How do I tell you what the author's purpose is? Focusing on building those skills of being able to do that, um, comp those comprehension pieces um, will give you the biggest bang for your buck. Anything else, Rachel? I don't see anything else in the chat right now. Thank you. Okay, and if you have anything else, just feel free to put it in. And again, Rachel, don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Okay, so let's talk then. We're going to kind of come back to this alphabetics and fluency piece, right? So I sort of described it in the slide before, but alphabetics is the ability to correctly identify printed words on a page. 
and also know what letters, letter blends, words, multisyllabic words, so compound words, what's the sound letter sound relationship? When, so when they see it, they can say, I don't know that word. I don't, I don't know what it is, but I can sound it out, right? And um, again, fluency is the ability to just re read e with ease and efficiency. We're gonna talk about accurate re accuracy rate and prosody again. So we're gonna start with alphabetics and I'm gonna break alphabetics down into two parts. You're going to have some students that you work with that really will need basic alphabetics. Um, so this is the very, very, very beginning pieces. This is learning what letters sound like, and it's learning to blend those individual sounds into um, short one syllable words, sight, learning sight words, um, breaking the um, you know, words into word parts. Um, and it's, it's a very basic piece. And there's some um, tools that I wanna show you that will help you to focus in on um, what an individual student might need for basic alphabetics. So um, Rachel, you'll make these things available to them, right? The yeah, and if you want, I I can just put them in the chat for right now. Okay, um, that's that sounds good. And they're all they're all connected here. Um, We will uh, make sure to get these uh, out to you. And Rachel, if you don't mind, that would be that would be um, wonderful. Yeah, I'm just looking for the okay for the slide. Um, so this first uh, resource that I want to share with you, which is something that you can use and is super easy to use, is a way to if you have a student that you think is struggling with basic alphabetics to kind of determine. Um, you know, what, what letter sounds are they struggling with and what do I need to specifically focus on? Now, again, remember when you're focusing on these things and working with students, it's only gonna be for maybe 10 or 15 minutes at a time. Um, this is something that generally, unless you have a group that's in that lower level of fourth grade or below, that you're gonna wanna pull a student and work with them one-on-one -on, -one on so that you're meeting their individual needs. Um, so this is a just quick analysis tool where the students um, try to read these words to you and you just mark what they're struggling with and where they're struggling with. You know, just circle it or put an underline underneath it, highlight it, whatever your uh, technique for reminding yourself what it is. And um, they have them in a couple of levels. And then this is your copy where you would put, hmm, they had trouble reading the word fan or they had trouble spelling the word fan. And then you'll come back and you'll kind of look at these letter blends and the things that they're struggling with, the letters that there's sounds that they're struggling with. And um, also uh, this would give you um, like the phonic skills. So do they have trouble with the short E rule or do they have trouble with, TCH, you know, do they not understand that sound? And then this is where you would create those little mini lessons. And I'm gonna give you some resources that are already created for you, where you can just focus on one or two sounds at a time until they really get it. So you, you don't, you don't wanna do it all at once. So once you figure out kind of where their struggles are, you would just focus on one or two areas at a time and then just keep moving on. So for the person who asks, how do I keep people interested? You don't, you don't, you just do it one or two at a time. And once they get it, move on to the next thing. And that helps also to, I think, keep students interested. So this is the Sylvia Green inventory. Um, this is a PDF. If you just even search this on Google, you'll find it. It's free and free to use. Um, this is a really helpful tool. The instructions are right here on the top. Um, super simple. And uh, that's one thing I want to say about alphabetics. Sometimes people say, I'm not a reading teacher. I'm not a reading specialist. I don't know. Um, you know, just doing one thing at a time. If you look it up in Google, like uh, resources, make little flashcards, um, just keep it simple, focusing on basic alphabetics, on understanding the sounds that letters make and the sounds that letter blends make, and maybe working on some of the rules and um, you know, what, what's the silent E rule, et cetera. So that's basic alphabetics uh, with Sylvia Green. I'm Carol, go back. were you, yes. we didn't see the screen and I was so focused on getting the links that I didn't 
realize. Oh, you didn't? Yeah, so we didn't see the inventory. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. That's okay. So I'm going to stop the share. And I am going to pull it up. Thank you for telling me because I didn't know. And I don't know why. Share the screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here we go. I might have to do this for the, I'll, I'll go out and do this for each of these. I'm not sure why I didn't show you. Okay, so um, let me make this a little bigger. So when you open the PDF, this is what it looks like. The directions are on the first page. And then as you go into the inventory, there it's clearly marked, this is the learner copy. This would be for you know, level one. If the students read all these, then they don't need to work on that. So skip that. Then they go to level two, the words are a little bit harder. You know? um, and when you're going through this, there's a teacher form. Little tiny bit smaller, just to make sure it's all on the page here. There's a teacher form that matches to level one and level two, where you would just mark here. So they are reading this list of words, and you would mark, hmm, they're ha they couldn't read the word fan or they couldn't spell the word fan. So then you can kind of go back after you do this quick little inventory with them and find, hmm, they're having trouble with the seek sound, right? The CK sound. Or just the K sound in general, and don't know the rules around CKK, the K sound. I'm gonna show you a, a, a little tool that you can use with them. And then this is the phonic skills. So this is where you can really kind of assess, um, you know, like for example, um, met, do they, know, do they know the sound of a short E? You know, cause E can make a different sound. That's the other part for our English language learners that becomes very difficult that different letters and different letter blends make different sounds or make the same sound. <laughs> um, so this just gives you a starting point um, for working with the students. And then here's um, your teacher copy. So again, if you Google this, if you just put in um, Sylvia Green's informal word analysis inventory, you'll be able to get uh, a free PDF. Good. Yeah, thank you. And that would, and that's the last link that I just put in the chat there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Rachel. All right, I'm going to go back to the slide and now you can tell me if you can see that, Rachel. Okay. Right. Mm. No? No. Okay. We still see the browser. All right. <laughs> okay. How about now? Yeah, so we're back at the very first slide. I know. Okay. 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 So um, the second resource that I want to share with you around basic alphabetics is uh, the ones with the glasses here are the ones I'm going to share with basic alphabetics. Uh, the others I'm going to share with advanced. Um, this making sense of decoding and spelling is a curriculum resource. Um, now tell me if it switches, Rachel. I think it should this time. Yes, it did. Okay, good. <laughs> I think I just hit the wrong share screen last time. Um, is another uh, tool, again, uh, it's in the chat, or you could just Google it, Making Sense of Decoding and Spelling an Adult Reading Course of Study, is a curriculum guide that gives you actual lesson plans that you can use for teaching basic alphabetics. Um, and it does also, it will move you into advanced alphabetics. So this is a really good um, resource for you to download and start looking at. It gives you some background information um, about alphabetics, but then it goes right into um, uh, lessons. So I'm just going to go to lesson two here. I hope I didn't take anybody on a roller coaster ride there that made you feel sick <laughs> scrolling through that. Um, so this is an example of one of the lessons and it gives you the purpose each day and um, you know, the, uh, the text that you're going to use. And then it helps you to just focus in on, in this lesson, you're focusing on the short A and E, 
uh, in CVC symbols, so consonant, vowel, consonant, syllables. And it takes you through different activities that you can do with students that, again, take about 10 or 15 minutes um, to, to do. And it is one long document that has all kinds of um, lessons. I can't remember how many, but there's quite a few lessons in here that cover most of the rules um, in basic alphabetics and moving you sort of into some of the advanced alphabetics. Uh, one of the things that you want to do with students is when you're teaching and you're doing a fluency lesson, you're also listening for uh, are they understanding the things that you're reviewing and practicing? So in this uh, curriculum, it gives you short paragraphs that uh, has multiple examples of the skill that you're trying to teach the student. So you can have do a little fluency activity with them. And it's a way of doing some formative assessment around um, are they learning the skills that you're teaching them? So this is the making sense of decoding uh, resource. Questions about those? These are just sort of two. I wanted to make sure I gave you some things that you could just use tomorrow, really. Um, um, there is one question, which is, yes. would you consider using the decoding resource for ELLs? Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I think uh, both of these tools would be good tools to use with the ELLs because it's going to help you see specifically on a very sort of, you know, micro level, where do you need to target some of your instruction? So whether you're working with low level AVEs or ELLs, both of these tools are absolutely appropriate for that. So I don't know if any of you, I know I've worked with some volunteers, I didn't ask this, who um, maybe you have to meet with their students online. <laughs> so I wanted to show you a couple tools to use online, but also these things are things that can be um, incorporated into uh, your classes. So the first one is called wordwall.net. And um, I'm gonna take you just to the website first to show you. Uh, now I'm worried that it's not showing, it's showing, right, Rachel? <laughs> yes, it's showing. Okay, good, okay, good. Um, so this is the wordwall.net uh, website and you can sign up for free and you can easily create, if you want to create your own, I'm gonna show you how they have a bunch of these that are already made that you don't have to create, but sometimes you wanna do, you know, you really wanna do just your own thing. You can quite easily create um, little games where you might match pairs. So matching pairs might be, you might be working on, at, set. So you're matching the S to the at, or you're maybe you are working in um, more of an advanced alphabetics and you're doing, you're working on um, word prefixes and, you know, word parts. So you might be teaching dis, right? Now remember students, dis means not or none. So you, when you see this at the beginning of a word, dis, it means that the word meaning is going to be negative, right? So you might be doing dis, uh, trust, you know, and you might be putting words together with a word beginning or a word ending. So you could do matching or missing or match up. You can make quizzes, super easy to do. Um, I wish I had time to show you how to make them today, but I'm just going to show you instead a couple examples of um, ones that are already prepared on there. And there's a lot when you go in. So once you create your thing, you can go into um, a section where they have games that are already made. This is the game section that you're looking at. Uh, I'm gonna, there's, there's sound to this. So I'm gonna stop the share and I'm gonna share again and I'm gonna share sound. So this is something you could give a student to do to practice independently and then come back and um, you know you can take a look at their results. Or this is something, if you have a small group of students who are working on the same thing, you can do it together. You just share the, uh, um, you share the link and then they can all work on it together. Or you can do it with them um, and you know, just have it on your iPad or if you're online, you can just share your screen like we are today. So 
In this little game, we're focusing on short vowels. I like this because it's not too kitty. It's it has a little bit more of a uh, adult feel. So, what sound do you hear at the beginning of? And it shows you a picture. Ah, uh, apple. And it's going to tell the student right away whether it was right or it was wrong. And in here, there's um, I think I forget like fourteen or fifteen. Um, questions in here. Oh, 12, 12 questions. What sound do you hear at the beginning of orange? So that's the O sound. And they can ask for extra time um, or go faster. So you get the idea, like this is one of the word wall games that uh, is in here. So I'm going to close this. I want to show you one other one. Hey, Kara. Yes. Just because this is Lynn, just because I use word wall all the time, you can also yeah. do the exact same activity and switch games. It'll take the exact same activity. So if you're doing like the quiz, you yes. can change it to a matching or whatever, and it'll automatically oh. switch it without you having to do anything, which is a once you put the sounds in, you mean? Yeah. Well, no, it, like even on the community board, if you like you picked up quiz and say you decided you want to do something different, all you yeah. do is go down and press like on the main screen and it'll switch it for you. Yeah. So, it's worked. So would you so would you say World Wall is a good resource for them? Liz? I actually pay out of my own pocket for this game. Yeah. I use <laughs> it all the time with all levels of students and they love it. Yeah, because there's also math stuff in here. So if you're also tutoring in math, there's all kinds of math things. Um, it's super simple to use. So I'm just gonna show you, um, thank you, Lynn, for interjecting that. Um, this is working on the sound. So here they're reading a sentence. And so they're working, this is more of an advanced alphabetics um, on the milk truck. So there's two two of the same sounds that they're working on, um, and they have. It's also helping them with their spelling. So I'm gonna spit my answer was I right? I was. <laughs> so um, in the ba uh, ba, uh, I'm looking at this k. So say I didn't know and say I put a k in. I'm just gonna show you what happens when you put the wrong answer. It tells them but it gives them an opportunity to correct it, which I really like because then it's it helps them to um, self-correct and, oh no, it is a different question. So I'm putting the wrong one in. <laughs> um, I do think it does, I don't, maybe I didn't have this set up right, but I do think it does help them to self-correct. Okay. So I think you get the idea. This, this is one um, option for, um, online tools that you can use with teaching alphabetics. And then the last thing, I don't know if any of you use Jamboard, but um, I am a fan of Jamboard. And actually I'm gonna show you that in the next section. I got ahead of myself a little bit. We're gonna look at Jamboard in just a minute. So before I move on, questions about basic alphabetics instruction, please feel free to put them in the chat. I don't see anything coming in, but if it does, Rachel, please feel free to interrupt me. I just see uh, somebody said great resources. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> All right. So then moving sort of into um, more of a person who might have advanced um, alphabetics needs. And these are, like I was saying, people who um, are having trouble with prefixes and suffixes, just simply focusing on teaching prefixes and suffixes and um, putting those together with other root words and talking about how prefixes and suffixes can change the meaning uh, or the tense is super helpful for students. And just picking again, one at a time to focus on um, is really the key. So maybe you're focusing on ED or you're focusing on ING or you're focusing on, uh, you know, Dis, as we said before, which I think is the example coming up. Um, that's really important. The other thing that 
is important for students to practice is breaking words apart and breaking them into recognizable parts. So, um, you know, if you can break a word apart and recognize, like I know sat, and that's part of this word that really helps students to start to build that skill of being able to sound out words that have multiple syllables. Um, if you search, I didn't put it in the PowerPoint today, but if you search the most, you know, mo the most common syllables, you're gonna get a list of the most common syllables found in words. If you just focus on those syllables, it makes a huge impact for students who are struggling with alphabetics. And then also, um, you know, like I said, your students are probably gonna come to you with a pretty, a much bigger oral vocabulary than maybe what they can decode when they see it written on the page. Um, you know, so beginning to recognize, like as you're reading with the students out loud, um, they maybe can't sound out a word or they don't recognize it, but then when they hear it and you say, oh, that's, um, I don't know, information. Um, they're like, oh, well, I know what that means. That really helps them to start to be able to um, decode larger words and then break that word apart. So what parts do you see? How do you blend it? Um, just spending some time with that with students is incredibly helpful. Um, so here's an example of um, word endings or word beginnings. I think we talked about that. This being the example, if students know that this means not or none, and they know the word miss, dismiss. Okay, what does that mean? That means um, I'm, we're dismissing you, we're letting you go. Distrust. Trust means that something, something positive, right? I trust you. But if it's distrust, so there's no trust, that helps them to begin to also build their vocabulary. So we're seeing how these components impact another. That's a good example of how alphabetics, if they don't understand word, like the decoding of that word, they might not understand the meaning of the word when they read it. Another example um, of just something to do with students is breaking words apart. Um, how many ways can you break a word apart? So I thought we could just take one second, try it out in the chat. How many ways can you break apart the word satisfaction? Um, how many little words can you find in there? How many word parts and pieces can you find in there? So if you wanna just take a second and try to put as many as you can in. Just gives you a, the idea of what you can do with students. And again, you can do this online just simply using chat, just like we're gonna do. Um, or um, you can have them put them on note cards and then, you know, um, bring them back together. Or you can make a set of note cards where they're taking word parts and they're putting together and making other words. Um, that is alphabetics instruction for those students who are a little bit more advanced, who are trying to. Um, decode multisyllabic words. Great. Excellent. Um, so a student might be able to see the word sat. They might be able to see the word fact. They might be able to see the word is. They might know the word ending T-I-O-N, chun, right? That's a hard one for students, usually one that you have to work on uh, with students who are struggling with alphabetics. Um, but this is, this is really important for them to be able to learn how to sound out uh, words. Excellent. Okay, so I wanted to show you then um, I wanna show you a couple more resources that are for advanced alphabetics. Now I'm gonna tell you this first resource, this mega words is, it is a book that you, your agency would have to purchase. Some of your agencies, I don't know where you work, but some of your agencies use mega words and they might have this on their bookshelf somewhere. So it would be worth asking your teacher that you work with, hey, do you have the mega words books? Um, what I'm showing you here is um, mega words has up to eight editions, right? Um, this is for grades four through 12. So when we're talking about alphabetics, 
we're really talking about mega words one and mega words two. So um, in mega words one, students are focusing on syllables, syllable types, syllabication rules. Um, and in mega words two, they're really moving more into the advanced alphabetics where there's all kinds of lessons on prefixes and suffixes, um, spelling, like learning like general spelling rules, um, root words and um, word endings. So uh, these are excellent resources where they have lessons that are pre-made where you can kind of look through the book and say, hey, my student is struggling with these specific things and um, pull out lessons that would help you. So let me go back here. Um, oh no, I wanted to do one other thing while I was there, I'm sorry. I wanted to show you, there are some lesson examples. If we scroll down. Actually, I'm just gonna look it up really quick. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, darn. I thought I had it open and I don't. Uh, please forgive me my driving today. Keep your hands in the vehicle. <laughs> okay. Okay, so um, when you go to the Mega Words, uh, it, uh, just like their homepage where you can buy the resources, there are some sample lessons. So I'm just going to open up the first lesson to show you an idea of what those lessons look like. Um, so This is the word list, and then um, if we go in, it'll give you practice with uh, the words in context, um, practicing with one syllable words, and um, all kinds of activities. So, this just gives you an idea of what's covered in. Um, Mega words one. Let's take a look at another one to see what we see. Uh, this would be for a higher level, the mega words three. These are moving into, uh, you can see that they're larger words where we're working on the AL and IC endings. Um, and then there's all kinds of activities that are in here to help students um, work with those different word parts. Okay. So this is just a good resource that I wanted to make you aware that you might have in your agency, um, but it is something that uh, it is a for purchase. The next um, resource uh, is another curricular resource that you can use. This is a free resource, and this is for intermediate word study. And this comes out of Lynx, which is the national level for adult education, research-based materials and resources. Um, and you can just, again, Google this one um, and find it. Um, easily and download it. I think Rachel maybe put it in the chat for us, but it gives you again, um, you know, multiple lessons for teaching different syllable patterns. Um, and, you know, gives you all kinds of examples and words. And you can go in here and um, this is uh, something you could even make, you know, if you wanted to use some flashcards or you use one of the online tools to make flashcards, you know, using the words list. Um, so it does a lot of the work for you of uh, finding information to make your lessons meaningful for your students. Okay, good. Questions about 
those two resources? Um, yes, so uh, Sumalatha asked if this is for reading only. Yes, so the intermediate words study and the uh, mega words two are just, they are just simply about um, really alphabetics, uh, advanced alphabetics. Um, Mega Words does move into, if you went to those other, uh, if the three through, I think there's maybe eight editions of it, um, it gets into really helping to build vocabulary as well, but it is a reading resource only for both of those. Yeah, so not so much with the meaning of the word. Um, oh, I see what you're saying. Um, I think that they do do some work around um, the meaning, but it is more specifically focused on when I see a word on a page, do I recognize it? It does start to blend into vocabulary because if I recognize it, then do I know what it means, right? So that's how alphabetics really impacts vocabulary. So you will talk with the students about the meaning of words, especially um, there's some words that we just have to memorize, right? There's some sight words that we just have to memorize. Um, but it really, the focus is about reading and decoding. Okay. So the last sort of online tool that I think is a good tool to use, and it's so easy to create. I don't know if any of you use Jamboard, but um, if you have a Gmail and you use Google Docs or any of those things, it's Jamboard is part of that Google package that's free on Google. And um, it is a tool that you can use where you can make um, slides that you can use for activities with students. So this is an example of, um, we took, uh, the word list 14 and mega words two practice page 14D. So it tells you up top where it was. I remember I said, this gives you word lists that you can use so you don't have to really think about it. Um, you can know that this is um, specifically going to teach the skill that you want to focus on. Um, and we just made a slide that we can um, share virtually with students. Uh, they can each have their own slide and they can just by themselves, if you have to be doing something else or you're working with somebody else, um, they can take these word beginnings, these prefixes, and they can drag them and um, match them up with words. Uh, and then you can go back and correct it. Sometimes you might be able to, there might be more than one match so they can uh, you know, see if you can make some different matches, just depending on how you set it up. And all they do is, um, they would just drag these uh, little, uh, uh, what are they called, post-its, and put them in front of the words. So this is just another example of something that's pretty quick and easy uh, that you can make. And you can save these once you make them and use them with other students in the future. So this is Jamboard, and this is just another example. Um, just to let you know, we have about seven minutes left. Okay, good, I think we're good. I think we're on good track. It does go fast though, Rachel, thank you. All right, so that kind of wraps up alphabetics. Um, I, just based on time, I know that there are a lot of challenges and sometimes this part seems very difficult, um, but the more you um, try it out with students, the more you're gonna see that it's really not. And I'm gonna say again, because this is the one thing I want you to take away from you from this part of alphabetics is that, you know, you need to kind of either listen to them read out loud and identify some areas where you notice a pattern of struggle or use the Sylvia Green um, sort of uh, inventory to get an idea of where they're struggling, uh, what sounds they're struggling with or blending of sounds they're struggling with. And then just focus on one or two of those areas at a time. You might have some advanced alphabetic students that really just have one or two areas that they're struggling. And once they really learn like, oh, when I see this written on a page, I know it, 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 that this is how I sound it out and this is what it means. Um, and that gets them moving forward really quickly. 
Um, but if we don't take the time to fill the gaps in this area, it really can impact comprehension for that. So take it, take it slow, little bits and pieces, 10 or 15 minutes at a time, a couple times a week can make a really big impact with the student. So any quick questions? And again, maybe just if you wanna put them in the chat um, when it comes to alphabetics, instructional strategies and practice. Um, I'm seeing a question about the naturalization test, which is not really, you know, that's not really what we're talking about today, but somebody asked if there are, oh, this was a direct message to me. Um, oh, okay. okay. So never mind. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But if we have, if anybody has great resources for the naturalization test, feel free to put them in the chat. Um, Cindy said, what would your focus be if you only have one time a week to work with students? Um, if, you're, if your focus is um, on helping the students to improve their reading, you really kind of want to think about, in my mind, the, you know, you have to have alphabetics to read fluency and with accuracy. So, if you think your student is struggling, then I would start with alphabetics. And, um, you know, if you have more than 15 minutes with them, though, you could probably do a little bit of alphabetics and a little bit of fluency. Um, but really, truly, if you have students that are struggling in these components or in that fourth to ninth grade band of learning, you know, it's going to be really hard for them to just learn how to comprehend better if they don't know how. They don't know they don't recognize words when they see them or um, they can't you know read with good rate and prosody they're going to really impact their comprehension if they're not working it. so it's well worth your time um, if you only see them once a week to work on some of these skills okay i'm just going to move into fluency fluency is, and i i, I spent a little more time on alphabetics because it seems typically more complicated to people um but Fluency, I think, is something that is much easier for, uh, for us to feel comfortable quickly continuing with students. So what we're listening for in terms of fluency, when we listen to a student read out loud, number one, we want to make sure that when we're practicing fluency, that they're reading something that's written at their grade level. If it's too high, you're really not going to get an accurate understanding of what their fluency skills are. What we need to do is ask them to accurately read at the grade level that they're coming to us at. So it's important for you to know that, all right? So can they recognize words and say them correctly when they're reading? Do they have good rate? Can they identify words and phrases with ease? Um, do they read at a good speed? Not too fast, not too slow. Um, and do they have expression? It's called prosody. Do they know to group words like in a, in a phrase? So they know to have a pause when there's a comma or a pause when they see and or but. Do they know that when they see certain, um, you know, grammatical things like an exclamation point that there's a little bit, there's a difference in the tone. Um, and so working on fluency um, is working on those three areas. And there's really four really good instructional strategies that I think are easy. Um, the first one is repeated oral reading. So again, spending 10 or 15 minutes with a text that's at the level of the student, all you do is you read out loud and model for them good rate and prosody and good accuracy. You read a sentence and then they read the sentence and then you read the next sentence and then they read the next sentence. Um, and you might repeat those sentences until they can say the words accurately. You can stop and give them feedback, but it's a way for you to model accurate reading, accurate decoding, and accurate rate and prosody, or good rate and prosody. Um, so that's very simple, and you can do that for about 10 minutes with a student. And as students get really um, proficient at the grade level that they're at, then try moving them up a grade level and see how that goes. 
Um, just keeping, you know, keeping to do that. That's a one-on-one -on -one activity. Um, the other uh, one would be a timed oral reading where you give them a certain amount of time. So this might be for somebody who reads too fast or too slow. Uh, you give them a certain amount of time and or a passage and um, they they work on that timed oral reading. That's really, that one is actually not one of my favorites. I really like the repeated oral reading. Um, and I also uh, like the echo reading. Um, again, where the student is echoing back and forth with you um, and you're reading out loud and they're reading out loud. Here, you're gonna just kind of read a sentence and then they're gonna read a sentence and then you're gonna read the next sentence and then they're gonna read it and so on and so forth. You're not gonna spend as much time with the, uh, re the repeated, you know, reading it over and over again, right? And then the last one is collaborative oral reading. And collaborative oral reading is um, something that you can do in a group. So some of you that have a group, and if they are all at about the same level, this is a good uh, activity. They could probably be hmm, three, three grade levels apart and you could have a good collaborative oral reading experience. Some of you might know this if you've been a teacher as popcorn reading, um, you know, where you would introduce the text, you would explain the activities, um, you know, kind of remind them what you're looking for and what you're listening for in terms of accuracy rate and prosody. And then you would begin to read. So this is when you're going to maybe use a passage. I, I really think that students like when you use a short novel that is interesting to them. It's something that they already have some knowledge around. Um, they really get into it. <laughs> um, and it, you know, you come back to it. So maybe you're reading a short novel for you know a couple of weeks together. Um, and you, uh, again, you start and then after a couple of lines, you call on a learner and then a learner calls on another learner and it just sort of popcorns around the room. Um, collaborative oral reading um, is really nice for you as the person who's teaching them because you can kind of be listening and doing that assessment of accuracy. Are there things they're having trouble with? Are they dropping the beginnings and endings of words, um, et cetera? So um, see that we're at the end of our hour. Yeah. Um, and I just, you know, want to take any last questions that you have about fluency instruction. Really feel that fluency and alphabetics, uh, they go hand in hand. And these are some resources. Uh, Newzilla, ReadWorks, CommonLit, um, using short stories, any text that you have, the key is making sure that you're using a text that's on the learner's instructional level. There's uh, one question in the chat from Lisa. It says, does the research show that oral reading fluency predicts silent reading fluency? I've always wondered because some students really resist oral reading. Well, you know, it's interesting because you have some students who read beautifully fluently, but they don't understand anything that they said. And um, that really, you know, so so then you ask yourself, hmm, what is that about? Well, were they reading really fast? Because if they were reading really fast, maybe they were just decoding, but they weren't decoding the meaning, right? So it probably says there's a lot of vocabulary issues. They might know how to decode the sounds and put sounds together, but they don't know the meanings of words. So um, I'm not sure if that answered your question. I would they think the answer is no. <laughs> Rachel, can you read the question one more time? Because I forgot exactly. Um, it says, does the research show that oral reading fluency, predi fluency predicts silent reading fluency? Yeah, so I might, I'm going to say no to that. You know, I think that... Um, it, it really, you know, some people, like I said, can read fluently and not really know. Yeah, I, I have encountered that as well. And it's yeah. just been sort of a nagging question in the back of my head. Yeah. Is, is are they really related or not? Yeah. So to, to me, I really think that when you see that, it comes down to they're not decoding the meaning, right? right. Yeah. So, it probably is a vocabulary. Okay, know. that that was a long time ago with kids, so it doesn't really apply. But it, 
I was curious. But you're going to find it with adults if you start sure. to influence you with them that some people can read beautifully and but have no idea. Many of my non-native English speakers can do that. Well, this is, we didn't get into comprehension today, but this is why yeah. we have to teach the skills of comprehension. What are some right. tools that you can use to comprehend? Because I can read it, but if I don't go back and reread and really think about what was the right. main idea and what were the key points and blah, 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 then I don't really know what I guess. Yeah. Was. Yeah. Well, and you, thank you. And there's go not ahead. really a way to test silent reading fluency <laughs> besides maybe <laughs> timing a student reading a passage. I've had courses where like one student takes a lot longer to read the paragraph than everybody else in the room. And that's kind right. of an indicator that maybe they need to work on fluency. But until you have them reading aloud, <laughs> you know, yeah, it's all just a guess. Yeah. 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 Well, good. Well, thank you all. Um, if you have any other questions, I'm help, welcome to stick around. But anybody who wants to go, right, Rachel? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Please feel free to go. Um, since we are a little bit over time, I'm going to stop the recording.